Hello, this is Friday's edition of The Daily Report. It's January 7th here in Korea. In less than a month, curtains will go up for the Winter Olympics over in Beijing. With details later on after a check on the global pandemic situation. I have Kwon Soa standing by. Soa, how is Korea ending its first work week of the year 2022? Well, Sunny, on a better note than we ended 2021, uh, we've got less than 4,000 infections this Friday. For a closer look, let's take a look here. 3,717 cases were tallied as of 12 a.m. And uh, that is 3,529 domestic transmissions and 180 case were imported cases. So that's not only a drop by around 400 cases from the day before, but also if you compare the figure to last Friday, it is an on-week plunge by over 1,150 infections. Now, cases fell particularly in the capital region in Seoul, Gyeonggi-do province, as well as Incheon, but there were also some other places uh, that's on uptick this Friday. Now, what is especially good news is the number of patients that are in severe or critical condition is going down, standing in the 800s for the second straight day. Now, let's move over to the general figures here. We've got uh, 45 additional fatalities, which raised the death toll to 5,932, and the total caseload stands at above 657,500. Now, moving over to our vaccination figures, uh, some 19,000 people got their first COVID-19 uh, vaccine shot a, a day ago, and over 84,000 got their second shot. Now, on the booster shot campaign, we've got over 367,000 who received that additional dose. Now, that's 20 million of the nation's population and 39.1%. Meanwhile, it uh, represents 80% uh, of those aged 60 and above that got an additional shot. Now let's move over to the international figures uh, where a grim milestone has been uh, recorded. More than 300 million people around the world now have been confirmed with the coronavirus and with an additional over 2.57 million new cases in just a day, uh, while over 7,800 people have lost their lives in the past day. And if we go over to the 20 countries that accumulated the highest numbers so far, the U.S. is approaching 60 million with an average of more than 600,000 daily infections in the past week and uh, six-digit figures in the U.K. and France over, again, so over 200,000 new infections. Uh, meanwhile, Argentina has hit the 6 million mark, uh, which also reported more than 100,000 cases, which is also a rise from the day before due to the Omicron variant. And those are the general updates that I have for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sonny? Right, so thank you for those tallies. Now, for more coverage of the ongoing controversy here in Korea over vaccine passes, Shin Yeun joins me in the studio. Yeun, Yeun, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Sunny. Right, so Yeun, it appears that public opposition to vaccine passes is gaining greater ground here in the country. That's right. The opposition to vaccine passes in Korea is becoming more fierce, and dissenting voices have grown louder after the government expanded the adoption of vaccine passes to include essential businesses like supermarkets. And many citizens say this is tantamount to an infringement of their basic rights, especially among those who are either unsure or unable to get vaccinated due to underlying health issues and other risks. Last Friday, 1,023 plaintiffs filed a class action complaint against the country's top authorities, including the mayor of Seoul, the health minister and the KDCA commissioner. They demanded that vaccine passes be lifted at all public venues, including restaurants and cafes, and a court hearing is scheduled to take place in less than an hour from now at 3 p.m. local time. And as you mentioned, Friday's hearing comes after the Seoul Administrative Court on Tuesday suspended the government's requirement for vaccine passes at cram schools and study cafes. This has been an ongoing topic this week. But the government immediately appealed this ruling and has insisted that vaccine passes are needed to ensure a gradual return to normal life. Take a listen. Vaccine passes have been the promised prerequisite for us to bring life back to normal. They have worked as a shield to protect everyone from tougher virus prevention measures yet again. The government will be open to making improvements if needed. Right, again, that is the government's stance then. What, meanwhile, can we expect, Yeon, from the looming court battle? 
Right. As of now, it's worth noting that the government has hinted at reaching a compromise. Authorities have said they would review plans to provide more people with vaccine pass exemptions, especially those with underlying health conditions. As for whether vaccine passes will be scrapped as a whole, though, this is a very tough question, especially since they've just been expanded to include more venues, meaning from next Monday, people who don't have vaccine passes or negative PCR test results will be denied entry to department stores and super supermarkets. Right, and yeah, this controversy over vaccine passes, it's universal, right? Definitely. It's been a heated topic of debate around the world, for instance, in Europe. Uh, after tumultuous debate, the French Parliament on Thursday approved legislation that would only allow those fully vaccinated to enter most public venues and purchase train tickets. As part of this new bill, negative PCR test results will no longer be accepted. And this legislation will go to the Senate before a final vote is made in the National Assembly. If it's passed, it will take effect from January 15th and apply to those over 16. And Italy has also decided to mandate vaccines for those over 50. Starting February 15th, public and private workers over the age 50 will be required to have the so-called Super Green Pass in order to continue working. And this will only be given to those who are fully vaccinated or those who have recovered from COVID-19. Also in the Philippines, President Rodrigo Duterte is taking a much heavier hand. On Thursday, he said, those who haven't been vaccinated will be arrested if they disobey stay-at-home orders. In a televised address to the nation, Duterte urged community leaders to make sure the unvaccinated do not leave the isolation of their homes. And this comes amid infections hitting a three-month high in the Philippines. Right, I see. All right, yeah, and for now, thank you for that. Right, up next, for the latest remarks of the local pandemic situation by authorities here, I have Soa back at the desk. So Soa, what was the gist of Friday's briefing by the authorities here? Well, Sunny, uh, the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters briefed the public on three major points uh, this Friday. An improvement of the COVID-19 situation, an assessment of the Omicron variant, and uh, the introduction of COVID-19 antiviral pills here in the nation. So let's start with the latter. The first batch of Pfizer's oral treatment Paxlovid will arrive next week uh, with no details unveiled on the exact amount or flight schedule yet, but officials say it may be around the 13th, which would be Thursday. Authorities vowed for thorough preparation so that the pills can be swiftly used on site. Korea has secured oral antiviral COVID-19 drugs for at least 1 million patients, which includes a pre-purchase contract with Pfizer as well as Merck's oral treatment, enough for 762,000 and 242,000 patients, respectively. And the government says it will provide the public with details in a briefing next week, which is expected to contain details on who will be subject to uh, receive the pills as well as uh, at which medical facilities uh, these will be distributed first. Right, and speak about medical facilities, so there's been a visible improvement in capacity there, right? Right, Sunny. So, uh, Yiki Il, a health ministry official who spoke at the briefing earlier, compared current key indices to those in early November. And as a result of ongoing expansions of hospital beds in the nation, the medical system is continuing to stabilize. Now, currently, around 1,754, to be exact, ICU beds for critically ill patients are in operation, which is 671 more than on November 1st. Hospitals designated for virus treatment have been expanded from around 10,000 to 14,900 as of today. With that, the operation of ICU beds nationwide stands at 53 percent. And even looking at the densely populated metropolitan region, operation dropped to around 55 percent. Since December 29th, no patients have had to wait at home before being assigned a hospital bed. The official also noted the general drop in cases as the number of domestic infections this Friday stood at around 3,500, whereas two and three weeks ago, this figure was in the 6,000s. Right, but regardless of those findings, so officials are highlighting the importance of public vigilance amid the presence of Omicron. Exactly, Sonny. And for that, uh, let's take a look listen to the government's latest assessment on this variant. 
The Omicron variant accounts for only 8.8 percent of recent cases, but it's become more likely to gradually become the country's most dominant strain. In this case, we could witness a temporary yet sharp increase in the number of cases, as well as a further strain on our treatment capacity due to infections in high-risk groups. The government will respond to this threat in advance by improving our efficiency in testing, tracing and treatment. While currently the country is capable of testing some two, uh, 750,000 people a day, what the government is planning in regards to a potential surge in Omicron cases is an expansion of PCR tests, a bot prioritized for certain groups, such as those at higher risk, for instance, at nursing hospitals and nursing homes. They are also expected to expand the use of self-test kits as a supplementary measure. So, for instance, while at nursing facilities, currently PCR tests are being conducted twice a week. Self-test kits may be used in between those tests when needed. And uh, I also want to mention that the official earlier who said uh, that there is uh, the, dom the Omicron strain could become the ver uh, dominant strain in Korea. That may happen in February, uh, he did say. And uh, in related news, the World Health Organization warned that the Omicron variant uh, does not appear, uh, does, uh, does uh, appear less severe compared to the Delta variant, but it does not suggest that it should be categorized as mild. Let's take a listen. Just like previous variants, Omicron is hospitalizing people and it's killing people. In fact, the tsunami of cases is so huge and quick that it is overwhelming health systems around the world. Hospitals are becoming overcrowded and understaffed, which further results in preventable deaths from not only COVID-19, but other diseases and injuries where patients cannot receive timely care. Now, the WHO chief also noted of the uh, latest increases in cases globally as uh, the numbers soared by 71 percent in the latest weekly count, and that's a record figure of 9.5 million. Uh, but uh, experts are saying that uh, this number may not even be correct because lately, uh, with the rampant spread of the Omicron variant, uh, there could be uh, miscalculations as well. So we uh, are likely to have an even higher number of total cases. And I mentioned earlier that uh, the number has already topped 300 million around the world. Uh, so with that, uh, the organization's uh, director general also mentioned that uh, we should continue to do our efforts in uh, basic uh, hygiene measures as well as uh, do something against the vaccine inequality as well. Right, basic measures as in watch your distance, wash your hands and wear your face mask. Exactly. Right, so as always, thank you very much for the coverage. See you on Monday. Yeon, thank you and hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Samsung Electronics appears to have beaten the pandemic, at least on the sales front, for the year 2021. Our Kim Sung-min has the figures to prove it. It seems like Samsung Electronics had its winningest year in 2021. It is likely to post record sales in 2021 on the back of its solid chip business. In its earnings guidance on Friday, the tech giant estimated its sales for last year to have grown almost 18% on year to around 232 billion US dollars. It also projected an operating profit of more than 42 billion dollars, of 43% from 2020. Samsung's staggering performance also comes as the company is expected to yet again set another record quarterly sales figure for the fourth quarter of last year. Projected to be around $63 billion, the record comes just one quarter since the company had posted its previous record in Q3. Samsung Electronics says the growing demand for smartphones, home appliances and displays in the last three months in 2021 helped the firm usher in the new year with success. But still, one huge factor behind the bumper figure for last year was the ongoing super cycle in the chip industry where high demand for semiconductors helped the company benefit from price hikes. 
While industry watchers say that the super cycle is drawing to an end, the price drops in memory chips were not large enough to pull down Samsung's overall performance. Kim Sung-min, Arirang News. And the government here has shared an ambitious employment plan for this month, as well as a pledge to ensure adequate supplies of agricultural produce ahead of the Lunar New Year. Our Min Sukyan reports. South Korea will provide thousands more jobs for the elderly, low-income people and young adults in the coming weeks. This is part of a government project to support the vulnerable amid the pandemic. Out of the 1.06 million jobs planned for this year, more than 600,000 jobs will be available this month. The announcement was made during a meeting Friday morning presided over by Vice Finance Minister Yeo Gwon. The move comes as employment conditions have been unfavorable due to the ongoing pandemic and strict quarantine measures. Early last month, the government already opened its first job posting for several ministries, including the Health Ministry and Labor Ministry. The second job posting is scheduled to be made within next week. The government is also expanding supplies on 60 most popular staples from next Monday. Ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday, supplies of apples, pears, napa cabbage and white radish will increase by 1.5 to 2.5 times more than usual. Beef and pork supplies will also rise by 1.5 and 1.25 times, respectively. The government plans to supply 204,000 tons of food products over the next three weeks until January 28. This is the largest ever amount of supplies provided and an extra week has been added to the supply period in a bid to stabilize market prices. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, here's yet another reminder for South Koreans overseas who hope to cast their ballots for the March 9th presidential election. Registration to partake in the vote itself ends on this coming Saturday. Our Lee kyung has more. Not enough time in a lack of polling booths are named as major difficulties for those wishing to vote from abroad. It takes only 20 minutes to get to the consulate from where I live, but for some, it takes a whole day. I remember in the 2012 election, there was a couple, probably in their 70s or 80s, who came all the way to Nagoya from the countryside, driving seven hours. Plus, weather and other emergency situations like COVID-19 could also discourage people from voting. To ease these unique challenges facing overseas voters, the National Assembly's Special Committee on Political Reform has passed a bill bringing structural changes to the voting process. First, setting up more polling booths. The bill allows a polling station to be set up for each region with at least 30,000 South Korean nationals instead of the current 40,000 requirement. And there can be up to three polling stations under each embassy or consulate instead of the current two. Second, giving enough time to vote. In case of natural disasters, civil war, public health emergencies, or other reasons, the respective election commission can make changes to the voting period. Third, removing complications for registration. Currently, those who have registered in the past two elections in a row are automatically listed, so one need to apply again. But the bill expands this benefit to more people, allowing anyone who has registered at least once before to remain on the permanent list of overseas voters. However, allowing a mail-in ballot system has not been passed due to some objections. The bills will be submitted to the upcoming plenary session and will likely be passed without controversy. And once they do, the new measures will be applied immediately to the overseas voting period set for February 23rd to the 28th. Lee kyung Arirang News. In other news, the international ripple effects of North Korea's recent missile test into the EC continue. In fact, the UN Security Council is supposed to meet on Monday to address it at the request of the US, the UK and France. Han sung has details. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on Thursday, U.S. local time, that North Korea's nuclear and missile programs pose a, quote, ongoing threat to the region and the international community as a whole. 
At an online security consultative meeting with his Japanese counterpart, Blinken also stressed the need to reinforce the U.S.-Japan alliance to meet such risks. And we're launching a new research and development agreement that will make it easier for our scientists, for our engineers, and program managers to collaborate on emerging defense-related issues, from countering hypersonic threats to advancing space-based capabilities. His remarks come after North Korea test-fired what they're claiming to be a hypersonic missile into the EC on Wednesday, Korean local time. Citing a diplomatic source, Russian news agency Sputnik reported the United States and several European countries, including the UK and France, requested the issue be discussed at the upcoming United Nations Security Council meeting, slated for next Monday. Earlier, a U.S. State Department spokesperson had called the North's test launch a violation of multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions. A senior official of South Korea's foreign ministry echoed the remark, saying the United Nations bans all ballistic missile launches and that Seoul is closely communicating with the U.S. and other member states regarding possible responses to the provocation. Germany's foreign ministry, in a statement on Thursday, local time, condemned Pyongyang's actions, saying the missile test constitutes a, quote, serious violation of the obligations set out by the relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions, and thus jeopardizes international and regional stability and security. It urged the regime to comply with its obligations and accept offers from South Korea and the U.S., to negotiate the denuclearization of the peninsula. Han sung Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Massive unrest in Kazakhstan continues, as local media reports say 18 law enforcement personnel were killed and hundreds others injured due to riots in Almaty. Almaty police chief says more than 120 police cars, fire engines and ambulances were burned by protesters, while over 300 shops, restaurants and offices were damaged as well. The presidential residence and the mayor's office in the city were both set ablaze. However, the city's airport, which was seized earlier by protesters, are now under the control of military personnel. After a night of running confrontations between protesters and troops on the streets, more than 2,000 people have been arrested. The widespread protests were triggered by recent fuel price hikes, as Kazakh President Kasim Jomart Tokayev called the unrest a terrorist threat and appealed for international assistance. One year since the deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol by supporters of former President Donald Trump, Additional security was put in place in Washington on Thursday. Security fencing was installed near the entrances of the Capitol building, while additional police were noticeable on the day. On January 6, 2021, around 140 police officers were assaulted during the riot, while one officer who battled rioters died the day after the attack. The attack on the U.S. Capitol also led to four rioters dying including one who was shot by police as she tried to climb inside the building through a shattered window. Despite being considered the worst attack on Congress since the War of 1812, the probe into the attacks has largely been played out behind closed doors. Serbian tennis star Novak Djokovic, who was denied entry into Australia to take part in one of the biggest tennis tournaments of the season, is now being kept in quarantine at a hotel in Melbourne. The world number one tennis player remains in Australia after his lawyers launched an appeal seeking to overturn the federal government decision as a court agreed not to deport him before a full hearing scheduled for next Monday. And Djokovic's mother slammed the decision to keep him at a hotel chosen by the government and not the one Djokovic booked. His accommodation? Yes. Terrible. Terrible accommodation. It's just some small uh, immigration hotel as we can, if it's hotel at all, with some bugs with, with uh, it's so dirty and uh, the food is so terrible. So <coughs> what can I say? They don't, they don't want to give him any chance to, to move on to some better hotel or house that he already rented. 
Djokovic was denied entry into the country following criticism of an earlier decision to exempt him from the COVID-19 vaccination requirement for the Australian Open. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Starting on this first week of the new year, we aim to bring you weekly coverage of some of the major issues in different countries through the words of pundits there. In our first segment, we turn to the U.S. and I have Chang Song Guan, the Deputy Executive Director of the Korean American Grassroots Conference, live on the line from Washington, D.C. Welcome to the program, Song Guan. Thank you for having me on, Sunny. Right, let's begin then with a few words on the snowstorm over in the U.S. that reportedly has over 90 million people in 37 states on high alert, including Washington, D.C. What is the current situation there? Well, this past Monday, Washington, D.C. saw eight inches of snow, which is set to exceed the record previously set in January 2019. Uh, it led to numerous road closures in the area, which caused a great deal of uh, issues for two reasons. Uh, one, there are a few hundreds of thousands of people who commute to the capital from the suburbs in Virginia, Maryland, on a daily basis, most of whom rely on cars and public transportations. And both of these means uh, proved unhelpful in the snowstorm last Monday. Number two, uh, what aggravated the problem was that it was the first day back at work uh, since the holiday season. So the highways, subways, and buses going into Washington, D.C. saw a whole lot more commuters than had seen in the weeks leading up to January 3rd. Uh, especially on the interstate highways leading into the capital region, the heavy snow created traffic jams that trapped travelers on the road overnight. Uh, Senator Tim Kaine, for example, who was a running mate of Hillary Clinton back in 2016, was seen stuck on I-95 for nearly 30 hours as he was traveling back to D.C. for work. Uh, it shocked a lot of people since the temperature was in the 60s just the day before the snow, uh, warm enough for many to walk around without a jacket. Uh, the snowstorm also led to power outages of about 100,000 households in the D.C. suburbs, leaving many families without heat for at least a day. These problems, uh, coupled with staff shortage in local governments and public schools, led to school closings and other disruptions throughout the week. And uh, as we speak, actually, uh, we are expecting another round of snowstorm in a couple of hours. I see. And... Also, this past Monday, Songwan, the U.S. topped the one million mark with regard to daily COVID-19 infections for the first time. I believe President Joe Biden addressed the nation the following day. Do tell us a bit about what was shared in his speech. Sure. Most of the message uh, from President Biden's remarks earlier this week and coming out of the federal government lately, really, uh, focus on encouraging Americans to get booster shots. Over the past six months, uh, we have seen a huge drop in the number of American adults without any vaccine shots from 90 million to 35 million. But that is still a large population who is unvaccinated. The daily number of new cases recorded nearly 1 million, as you said earlier this week, and we've been seeing thousands of flights being canceled every day. Uh, there are long lines at testing sites and several members of Congress, too, testing positive. Uh, I myself have recovered from COVID last week, and it's becoming increasingly common here in Washington, D.C. So the uptake is very much real. As President Biden recognized in his remarks this week, there are needs for additional support for hospitals across the United States. This includes protective equipment, staff, and beds. And in his speech, the president vowed to provide the support, as well as announcing that the federal government has doubled its order of COVID treatment pills from 10 million to 20 million courses in order to help curb the pandemic. Right. And staying with the president, I understand his approval rating, Songwon, has been on the decline. And some observers are linking this reality to the pandemic. What are your thoughts? Well, President Biden's job approval rating has indeed uh, steadily been dropping since his inauguration, uh, now at 53.9 percent disapproval. Uh, but this trend is, in fact, very common in the first two years of any presidency since the polling has been taken in the Harry Truman era. Uh, only one president has been accepted from this pattern. Uh, the reasons behind this trend uh, are a few. Uh, one, the person occupying the White House is usually blamed for any issues in the economy. Number two, those who did not support the president in the last presidential election become increasingly vocal in expressing their opposition. And politics have, as we all know, become more and more polarized. 
In addition to that, as you may have uh, may mentioned, Americans of all walks of life are by now worn out and tired of the adjustments we've had to make to live in the pandemic era. Uh, certainly, President Biden suffered a few difficulties since assuming office almost a year ago, such as Afghanistan, inf intraparty conflict, and inflation. Uh, but I'm not sure if the low approval rating is unique to Biden or uniquely high compared to his precedents. Right, and staying within the political arena, Song Guan, the 2022 U.S. midterm elections are 10 months away. And the primaries for congressional and statewide races, I understand, are said to be more important than ever for both political parties. Could you explain this reality for us? So in the United States, federal elections take place every two years. Uh, half of them are the ones uh, that take place every four years, include presidential elections. And the others, in which we elect only members of Congress and no, uh, not the president, are called midterm elections because they take place in the middle of each presidency or presidential term. Uh, the federal election taking this place, uh, taking place this November, is a midterm, which is almost always favored for the party, opposite to that of the president. Uh, this year's midterm election, though, is particularly interesting to the Korean American community in that it may cement the footings of the four Korean Americans currently in Congress, two in each party. Uh, one of them, Congressman Andy Kim from New Jersey, is running for his third term, whereas the three others, all of whom women, are running for re-election, re which is a big test for most freshman members. Uh, once the four Korean American members of Congress are re-elected, it may really pave the way for them to stay in office for a long while and to move up the ranks within the House of Representatives. Right. Aside from politics, Hong Kong, what appears to be some of the issues of interest for Korean Americans there at the moment? Well, there are so many, but I, I like to share um, this one thing, uh, which you may know. Earlier this week, a Korean American anchor in Missouri was criticized as very Asian after sharing on TV that her family ate dumpling soup on the New Year, which she explained as uh, is what a lot of Korean people do. The criticism that came from a viewer who wished the anchor to keep her Korean to herself stuck a, uh, struck a chord with a lot of Korean Americans and really all Asian Americans in this day and age where, uh, where we've battled the sharp surge of racially charged aggressions and violence against our community over the past few years. We've seen some hopeful progress lately, of course, with the addition of a Korean American Muppet on Sesame Street, the launch of the first Asian American doll in American Girl, and the success of Squid Game and such. But this incident really proves that we still have a long way to go to be accepted as Americans ourselves. Not just a cool new thing in made-up spaces, but someone they don't really want to live on the same block with. Right. And a very uh, quick question before uh, we let you go. We've been covering this particular issue in our news segment here at Arirang since the start of this week. I'm talking about the overseas voter registration for Korea's presidential election, which is slated for March 9th, Song Gwan. Um, interest here, though, appears to be relatively low. Is this also the case over in the U.S. among Koreans there? Uh, well, I'm afraid I lack the authority or knowledge to speak on this issue uh, as it is not part of American politics. However, from what I've heard from those interested in participating in the Korean elections while well, in the United States, uh, some wish that they could vote by mail uh, because otherwise they have to drive for hours to get to a polling site. Uh, it seems as though the poll sites are placed at consulates general across the United States and very few other places, uh, which could be a challenge for those not living in large metropolitan cities where the Korean consulates general are typically located. I see. All right, Songwan, thank you very much for making the time to join us live at this uh, with your thoughts. Thank you, Sonny. We are counting down to the Beijing Winter Olympics, which will kick off on the 4th of February until the 20th. The event comes amid rebounds in COVID-19 cases in light of Omicron and diplomatic tensions between China and a number of Western nations. For more on the upcoming sporting event, I have Yuji Hu from Yonhap News Agency. It's been a while. Chiu, welcome back. It's great to see you here, too. Right. I also have visiting Professor An Junsung from Yonsei University. Professor An, thank you for being here. Thank you. 
Right, Joe, we'll start with you. The upcoming Winter Olympic Games in Beijing appears to be the second Olympic event amid the pandemic following the Summer Games over in Tokyo last year. How do the current preparations for the Winter Games compare to those of the Summer Games, you think? Well, I think the Beijing uh, organizing committee is taking cues from Tokyo just last summer in terms of running, trying to run an Olympic Games during the pandemic. As you mentioned, this is the second one during the pandemic. But I think it also helps Beijing a little bit that uh, the Winter Olympic Games tend to be smaller than their Summer Games. Uh, fewer sports, uh, fewer participants, uh, I guess fewer venues as well. So in, in terms of trying to control the spread of the virus, it might be a little easier, relatively speaking, for Winter Games. But obviously, this uh, Omicron variant did not exist last year. It, was a, it is a new threat. Uh, it is a new problem uh, for Beijing. But at the same time, I think it's way too close to the Olympics to call it off. Um, logistically, just there will be too much headache to do it at this point. Uh, if you recall, the Tokyo Games got postponed about four months ahead of the time uh, in March 2020. And now we're sitting here less than a month to go to, to Beijing Games. And it's a way too close. And uh, it might be a little... Uh, actually easier to just, just to push ahead and try to you know figure things out on the, on the go and uh, again um, you know they now have the example from Tokyo to to kind of try to learn from to try to pick their brains a little bit if you will uh, as far as uh, you know trying to get this done uh, during the pandemic the best way they can. Right and it appears that the International Olympic Committee has agreed with you because they have reaffirmed that the games will go on. Now Professor An, on the diplomatic front what is the latest with regard to the US-led diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics? Yes, uh, <clears throat> before I talk about the you know, diplomatic boycott, right? There's a difference between full boycott and a diplomatic boycott, right? The, for, the, for the full boycott means that you're not sending athletes, but the diplomatic boycott means that you're not sending government officials to the games, right? So the one thing is here. So the, according to the press, there's about 11 countries have uh, declared uh, diplomatic boycott for the you know, Beijing Olympics, right? Including US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. Interestingly, uh, Japan is only one Asian country uh, declared a uh, political boycott here this time. For in terms of human rights abuse issues in China and Xinjiang area especially, and the issue is that the, on surface it seems that there's um, human rights issues between two countries, uh, not you know, Western country and China, but uh, but in I mean in this in the bottom is that I think that's about the struggle for the uh, you, know, you know hegemony between the big power comp the countries, right, the U.S. and U in China, U.S. want to maintain the number one status, and the, you know, China obviously want to be number one in the future, right? So kind of a, there was a, a pressure between two countries, you know, and continue with the uh, uh, Olympic Games as well. Right. right, and staying with that, Professor An, President Moon Jae-in, for his part, has rejected the possibility <coughs> of South Korea staging a diplomatic boycott of the upcoming sporting event. Having said that, what are the prospects of his personal attendance at the Games? Well, I think there's two issues, right? One, one is the whether uh, President Moon should visit Beijing, right? Number two, question, number second question is that when, if he planned to do, we announce the, his visit, right? First question, uh, in terms of whether he should, uh, personally, I think that he, sh he should visit it because that, you know, obviously we have North Korean issue, which uh, China always has, can play a big, you know, part. In North Korean issue always, so I think we need to get close, you know, not to distance from the Chinese government. And plus, uh, you know, if we have some have a problem with the sad, you know, the so citizen years, we have some issues with the political issues with the Chinese government. So I think it's it's good time to get good send good gesture to the Chinese government. Also, there is another international games be held in China, right? In the uh, Asian Games coming in September. So it will be the last, actually, the uh, international games he can attend as the head of, you know, country. But I think it's a good gesture, political gesture to the, uh, you know, succeeding president who joining the Asian Games. So it's more like a political issues and uh, maintain, you know, a stronger tie, but perhaps closer tie with Chinese government, I think is really a big point uh, to, you know, Korean government. Right. And, Gio, meanwhile, the COVID-19 Olympic protocol drawn up by China appears to be more stern than that drawn up by Japan during the Summer Olympics. Do you care to elaborate? Right. Uh, you know, they've got this thing called the playbook. Uh, despite the connotation, there's nothing, you know, playing about that. Uh, it basically lists all the health and safety protocols in it. And they, they, have, they will set up something called the closed loop system. Uh, it's basically a bubble. It means you're stuck to your hotel, your accommodation or your competition venues or training venues and pretty much no other place that can you're allowed to go. Uh, you, you'd only be able to travel to permitted Olympic related destinations using 
Olympic dedicated transportations. Uh, so no public transit for athletes or members of the media or uh, other games related officials. And you know, Beijing is also recommending that athletes will to leave the country within 48 hours after the end of their competition, which is the same deal as Tokyo. Um, so that kind of takes away from the whole experience of being in the Olympics. Uh, I guess the fun part for the athletes, right? Uh, look, uh, you know, going to other events, uh, cheering for the athletes from their own countries and looking at uh, some of the other events they don't compete in. Uh, so that element will be taken away from them for the second uh, consecutive Olympic Games in winter. Um, what else? You know, for now, they're banning the international spectators. Uh, they would only allow fans from within China to attend, but they haven't decided on the size of the crowds just yet. Uh, but the few lucky ones that do get to see the Olympic Games in person, uh, they will not be allowed to do any vocal cheering. Uh, no screaming, no yelling, basically just clapping, uh, which is something that we've seen, I think, in Korean sports during the pandemic the past two years. So, um, so there, there's going to be a lot of restrictions. But uh, you know what? I think that's what it takes to to have a safe and, uh, I guess, you know, quote-unquote successful Olympics during the pandemic. Right, of course. Uh, Chiyo, the Olympic Committee here in the country has set mm -hmm. a rather modest medal target of, I believe, one or two gold medals. What are your thoughts on this? I believe in the Pyeongchang we won five gold medals. Five gold medals and five, at least five in three of the last four Olympics. And, you know, this is a country that has won at least two gold medals at every Winter Games since 1992. So, right, which is why. Why is it one or two Right, gold so one medals? or two is very modest. But also, say, at the same time, I think it's very realistic. Uh, if you think of you know, the, the situations that are facing some of the main sports for Korea, for, for instance, short track. Uh, Korea has been the most successful short track country in Olympic history, 24 gold medals, 48 overall, more than any other country. But uh, things have changed. Uh, times are different now. Uh, I don't think we can just expect Korea to kind of walk into the ice rink and come away with two or three gold medals easily. Uh, you know, other countries have made some significant strides in recent years. In some events, uh, legitimately, some countries are just better than Korea right now. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge up your battle uh, for Korean short trackers to try to win uh, even one or two gold medals. And there's, there are some other off-ice issues that I don't think we have time to get to at this moment. But uh, there's a lot of distractions around the national team in the short track as well. And uh, from Pyeongchang, we saw some surprising medals from skeleton bobsleigh, some track events, uh, sliding events. Uh, athletes in those events have been struggling in recent years, so I don't think they're considered medal contenders at this point. But on the brighter side, um, if you recall, the women's curling team surprised a lot of people by winning silver coming out of nowhere in Pyeongchang. The same team is going back to the Olympics in Beijing. Uh, they were number three in the rankings, and uh, they should be able to contend for another medal. And one other athlete I wanted to talk about, uh, alpine snowboarder Yi Sang-ho, who also was a surprise silver medalist in 2018. Uh, right now, he's the World Cup points leader uh, in the uh, uh, International Skiing Federation this season. So uh, at this point, he should be considered uh, one of the stronger medal contenders. Right, and we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, Professor Ann, what are your thoughts on the possibility of substantial cross-border talks during the Beijing Winter Olympics as both careers are poised to attend it? Well, uh, well, we will talk about this issue, right? We have some go back to the Tokyo Olympics, right? Because North Korea uh, decided not to join the Tokyo Olympics, so they got sanctioned by IOC, so they technically cannot join this time. So that was the issue, technical issue. And then the, the other question is, is there a meeting of mind between two Korea, right? Two countries, whether they're willing to do. Obviously, uh, we see the recent missile <laughs> test, right? North Korea, Monday, right? That's yes, really Wednesday, sending very big signal to everyone in South Korea say, maybe they're not ready to talk and maybe they're not willing to talk, right? So, but anyway, but the negotiation, in terms of negotiation between two you know, sides, is that I think that we ha always keep open-minded, right? So you never know what happens. And officially, maybe they cannot send any athletes or sending a government official to the Beijing, but they always have a people in those Korean people, high officials working in Beijing areas. So, so we, I think we have always uh, opened the channel. And that in terms of the, how the government uh, react to this situation, I think I think using the strategy of you know politi political ambiguity basically, they're not saying clearly. Well, we say yes or no, and we'll, they will wait on the last minute whether they what to do because of the due to the you know U.S. pressure by U.S. government on the joining the you know the their boycott, but we did not join it. And also, there's some pressure also, right? And think about the Huawei situation, and the U.S. government was kind of pushing many countries to join their 
kind of ally against the Huawei, but you know, South Korea really didn't rejoin it, but compared to Japan's situation, they will get, really get close to the US government, right? Also, they decide not to go to Beijing also. So we have to see the big picture, and then we, when it's in terms of solving the North Korean issue, we need the uh, uh, cooperation from the neighboring countries, especially China, right? So also the Japan too, right? So I guess that's the things we approaching it, the big picture, you know, serving the North Korean problem. So we'll do our best and then you never give up, right? I guess, you know, it's always the best and then open the, open the channel and listen to them, whatever they're changing it, right? Right. Chiu, what has been disclosed meanwhile about our own preparations for the upcoming games? Well, uh, you know, just the Earlier this week, uh, Korean the athletic delegation marked the 30-day countdown uh, to the Olympics in, in Beijing, and you know they're, they're, the athletes talked about the, the modest target set by the National Olympic Committee, and I, I think it honestly bothers them a little bit. And one or two gold medals, um, you know, they, they think that they can exceed that easily, um, and they will try to kind of take it in stride. Uh, you know, they see it as something that kind of lessens the pressure on their shoulders so they can just go out and try to maybe surprise some people uh, in terms of maybe winning more than two gold medals. Uh, right, do you Beijing. suppose it's a kind of strategy then from the Olympic Committee? Might be a little yeah. bit, uh, but the uh, National Olympic Committee has tended to kind of fall on the conserv conservative side when it comes to medal projections. I think part of the reason is to lessen the burden on the athletes and um, I think it, might, it just might work this time. Uh, you know, they're, they're driven, they're, they're all competitors, right? Uh, you know, they've invested a lot of time in uh, effort in preparing for the Olympic Games and uh, they don't want to hear anybody saying uh, you know you're going in there maybe trying to win one, one or two gold medals. I, I think they honestly believe that they can, they can do a lot better than that. So right. uh, we'll, we'll see what happens especially with the short track in terms of you know, trying to uh, fight off some of the distractions off the ice and trying to focus on the, uh, their, their races on the ice. Right. Professor, uh, given the diplomatic hurdles it faces now, I suppose Beijing's gains by hosting this latest Winter Olympics in the country would be rather minimal. What are your thoughts? Well, well I think that they already get, you know, political achievement, right? Because that if we look at this way, like the Beijing is the first country which hosts both Winter and Summer Olympic Games. Right, so I think that's really big achievement already. So and plus they they want to do you know really the powerhouse. No, you know they were number one, number two or you know G two right basically. But that's the really competition there. And but the because of the some political prop, our issues with U.S. and the, some Western countries, they have to deal with it. But uh, my point is, is that we have to wait and see how it happens. But due to the COVID nineteen situation, we can expect really the wonderful achievement because the you know things change, everything change in terms of the you know quarantine issues, a lot of international politics and. And then, and but however, I will we'll see how they handle it, and then maybe they can handle it better, very good, better. Maybe they would, in terms of quarantine, maybe they might be better because this is a smaller compared to summer Olympic Games. You know, Olympic Games are smaller, less venue also, right? Also, we'll see how they handle the situation, and they can show sending some message to the other countries that the China is not that bad. You know, they are very, you know, in terms of you know something doing some, you know, hosting some international, you know, Olympic Games. Maybe they can show upgrade their international status. You know, I think there's maybe opportunity still for them. Right. right, so there is still opportunity for them then. Yeah. Uh, Chiu, do you predict changes within the Olympics itself post-pandemic? I, I do. Uh, I think uh, gone are the times when you know we take these things for granted. Uh, you know, I think we saw from Tokyo that uh, you know COVID nineteen calls all the shots. I, I don't think we can control what's going to happen and how how to how to conduct the Olympic Games anymore. So I think. Uh, you know, these are strict uh, you know, restrictions and health and safety protocols will be part of uh, many uh, Olympic Games uh, going forward. And, you know, Tokyo was the first one in Beijing. Now, again, once again, trying to set an example for others to follow, Paris in two years' time and, and what have you. So, you know, just in normal times, I guess the whole idea of bringing people from tens of thousands of people from, you know, almost every country in the world, putting them in the same city for two weeks and sending them back home, even in normal times, that doesn't seem like a very good idea, health-wise. But now we're in the pandemic, we're trying to pull this off. Uh, you know, it, this is a challenge uh, that uh, I think a lot of other host cities coming up will face as well. Right. And beyond Korea, too, what are some of the matches that are likely to draw attention, do you suppose, at the Beijing Winter Olympics? Well, you know, figure skating is always a marquee event. Uh, but uh, unfortunately for Korea, after the retirement, uh, retirement of Kim Yana, we haven't had any 
sort of transcendent figure to come out and try, try to contend for a medal in the Olympic stage. But if you're a figure skating fan, there's still a lot to look forward to. Um, the younger skaters from other countries are just so much better, uh, technically so much more accomplished than before. So there's something to look forward to for figure fans of figure skating. Um, ice hockey, another very uh, popular event. Unfortunately, we will not have the best players in the world available uh, from the National Hockey League, but uh, maybe some of the former NHL players and some other uh, North American stars uh, will be able to make the trip to Beijing and try to do their countries proud. Right, hopefully. Professor An, what is your outlook with regard to tensions now between Beijing and Washington post-Olympics? Well, actually, it's more like uh, what is the cause and what is the effect, I think is the question here. That the, the, the worsening uh, bilateral relation between China and U.S. kind of a, is the cause. The effect is that, you know, the, the political boycott of the Beijing Olympics Games, right? So I think that, as we discussed earlier, like, it's all about the struggle for the hegemony, right? So who's going to be number one? Well, who's going to be number one, right? And also, the, um, the, I think it's more like a hawk and dove game. It's like one of the game theories, like you're, you're fighting for, you know, is that kind of animal survival issues, you know, takes all situations. So both the U.S. and China, Chinese government try to be number one, who will be the sole survivor getting getting all the benefits they have it. But the, the interesting about the, the game is that they're asking question that is it worth fighting for? If it worth fighting for, they go all the way down. But they, if the player think that it's not worth fighting for, they kind of become a chicken, right? You know, playing chicken game style. So I think that in terms of U.S. and China relation is that it's more like they're playing hook and dog situation based, uh, based on the situation. If they think that there's worth fighting for situation, they will fight all the way. To that, but however, if they think that it's not worth fighting, it's like a, a Beijing Olympic game. It's not worth it's not worth playing dying for because that is only the game international community, and they, that's why I think they change it downgrade to the uh, political right boycott rather than full boycott. Right, right? so I it's see. kind of compromising the both countries. Right, so I think that will uh, keep uh, you know keep track with how they deal with situation by situation. Is it will be worth fighting for? Right, or I not? Yeah. I see. All right, Professor Anne, as always, thank you very much for your insights. Yeah, thank you. She, as always, thank you for your uh, thoughts as well. Thank you. Right, well, the Winter Olympics are now less than a month away. For the sake of the athletes and their coaches who have remained devoted to this upcoming event, let's hope for an improvement in COVID-19 conditions prior to the Games. Thank you for watching.